Welcome to Marine Ecology. This lecture is going to be an introduction to the Marine Ecology course. I teach at Florida Gulf Coast University and a first chapter, so to speak, in understanding the science of marine ecology. If you are watching this and you're not part of the course, you can just sort of skip over the first couple of slides, which will talk about how the course is run and get into the later part, which talks about the basics of the science of marine ecology. So for those of you who are Florida Gulf Coast University students, I have a couple of rules for my classroom. These are obviously a little bit different in this online format teaching, but I think it's very important to be yourself. I want you to feel free to share your thoughts, questions, and concerns, and know that you won't be judged harshly by me or each other, and that we'll all be understanding and supportive of each other. I want you, if you're a student in the class, to uh, attend all the classes or translate that to view all the recorded teaching materials because you will be, if you're taking the course, responsible to know all of the stuff that's presented on the slides and talked about here. So if you want more detailed information on the assignments and tests and things that we're doing in the class, it's all in the syllabus, which is posted on our Canvas page for the FGCU course. There is no textbook for this course, but I have been writing detailed lecture notes, which are sort of like an accompanying text to go along with the lectures, and they go more in depth and will help you answer the practice questions for the exams, which are also posted on Canvas and are very important to go through to prepare yourself for the actual exams. Um, in addition to the information that you get from my lecture notes and these recorded presentations, I encourage you to look up other information sources. Any reliable scientific information source is fine um, and will add depth and, and flavor to what you're learning. So you can find reliable scientific sources through search tools like Google Scholar and the Florida Gulf Coast University Library. We normally do some hands-on components of this course, including a field trip to our local estuary, Estero Bay, and a multi-day field trip to the Florida Keys. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we um, are putting those on hold. Although on the Canvas page, you'll see some information about alternative activities. The way that you're graded in this class is mostly based on exams. There's three exams, each worth 20% of your grade, so that totals to 60%. Um, and uh, then there's classwork and participation activities, which is sort of a variety of things that you'll turn in online that are linked to the content that we're covering. Sometimes they relate to extra readings that you have to do. And then there's one big essay that you have to write and turn in near the end of the semester that I'm calling a synthetic review paper. That can be on a topic of your choice, anything related to marine ecology, but I'll provide some examples of possible topics that you might want to get into that'll help you learn more about the Florida environment and environmental issues in particular. Uh, and the grading scale that I use for this class is on the right hand side. If you are taking this class for your major, I think you need to get at least a C to get credit for it. Um, otherwise, it's the usual don't get an F rule. Let me say a little bit about myself. This uh, disembodied voice that's delivering the lecture here um, belongs to a real person. I was born in Washington State in Seattle, Washington, and I grew up in Olympia, Washington. Uh, so I'm now in the opposite corner of the country that I grew up in, but both Florida and Washington State have some commonalities. They both are bordered by ocean, and it was in the beautiful um, beaches and uh, forests of Washington State that I developed my love for the ocean that, uh, along with other factors, led me towards a life of science. I went to college and studied biology at Rice University in Houston, Texas, uh, but I knew even then that I probably wanted to be a marine biologist, so I tried as I was an undergraduate to get as much uh, extra experience in marine biology as I could through summer internships and things like that. 
and, uh, and I applied to graduate school and was accepted at uh, William and Mary's Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is a graduate school and research institution for marine biology and uh, oceanography. Uh, I got my PhD there in 2008, and the first job that I had with my PhD, which is called a postdoctoral research fellowship, was as a researcher at the Smithsonian Marine Station in Fort Pierce, Florida. Um, I studied seagrasses there. And my second job two years later was uh, another job focused on seagrasses and seaweeds, but this one was in a much colder environment at Northeastern University's Marine Science Center in Nahant, Massachusetts. Um, so I got to study a very different marine environment. And while I was at that job, I interviewed for a professor job at Florida Gulf Coast University, which is what brought me to where I am now in Florida studying seagrasses and other sea bottom life um, in this nice warm ecosystem. So this is a picture of some students that are working in my what I call the benthic ecology research lab at Florida Gulf Coast University. Benthic ecology means st you're studying the things that live on the bottom. So I mostly study seaweeds and seagrasses but I also study other life on the bottom like oysters. And I love to have students volunteer in my lab or do internships. And so uh, contact me if, if that's something that you're interested in. All right, let's get to the basics of ecology. What is ecology? Here we're looking at a beautiful underwater picture that I took on one of our field trips in the Florida Keys. And you can see that there's a lot of sea life here, these beautiful um, yellow fish, which are actually juvenile bluehead wrasse. There's a variety of living corals uh, here. And so we can tell that there's, there's a lot going on in this picture. And um, we may have sort of like a feel for what ecology is. And yet if someone asks us to actually explain like, well, what is ecology? Uh, we might be at a loss for words. So hopefully my little explanation on the next couple of slides will clarify for you what ecology is really. So ecology is a, a type of biology. So biology is the study of life in general, but life is very complex and that complexity is at different scales all the way from the atomic scale up to the scale of the entire earth, which we call the biosphere. Um, so if you're studying things at very small scales, you might be studying the details of cells and molecules, um, organs and organ systems within an organism. Um, but if you're studying life at broader scales, you might be studying multiple organisms that form a population. You might be studying how uh, populations of multiple species interact with each other, which is called a community. So any kind of biological study that's at the higher levels of broadness and complexity uh, is called ecology. So that includes population, community, ecosystem, and, and biosphere studies. So just to reiterate that population ecology is where you're focusing on one species but multiple individuals. So you're looking at where that species is distributed, how abundant it is, and the demography of the individuals within the species, which means the birth rates, death rates, the age and size ranges within that species. So everything about that species uh, and its numbers across the world would be population ecology. Adding another level of complexity where you're no longer considering just one species, but you're considering multiple species that interact with each other, that makes it community ecology because an ecological community refers to an assemblage of multiple species in an area that interact with each other. Um, and then a further level of complexity is where you're considering multiple species, not only their interactions with each other, but also their interactions with the surrounding environment, including the transformation and flux of energy and matter. So sort of how they're processing materials in the environment like carbon dioxide and oxygen and um, uh, nutrients and things like that would be considered ecosystem ecology. Um, so if we're, um, so really the entire planet is an ecosystem because 
everything on the planet in some indirect way affects everything else. But usually we, for convenience, divide the global ecosystem, which we call the biosphere, into smaller component ecosystems. Like we might talk about a particular estuary as an ecosystem rather than the entire ocean as an ecosystem. Um, we usually sort of focus at sub-levels of, of the ecosystem. All right, so let's try to apply these definitions of ecology with a terrestrial example. Terrestrial means on land, so instead of focusing on the marine environment right now, we're going to do something which may be a little more familiar to you all since you are terrestrial organisms. Uh, and we're going to look at this ter uh, terrestrial organism. It's a, a rabbit, a bunny. And uh, hypothetically, I I'm going to study this bunny. I'm going to study its anatomy, its its fur, its physiology, its body temperature, its, its cell biology. Well, I can sequence its genes and look at its genetics. Um, so I can study this, this bunny in great detail. And will that be ecology? Okay, if you answered no, that's correct. Because studying just one single organism, no matter how much detail you study it in, uh, is, is not ecology. However, if I studied groups of uh, this b um, bunny and I studied how they reproduce and what their population was and where they're located and um, that then would be population ecology. So I'm uh, so now that I'm studying lots of bunnies, even though it's still just one species, uh, I'm now doing uh, a type of ecology, not just uh, organismal biology. Um, and again, population ecology is studying the distribution, abundance, and demography of an organism. Let's add more complexity now. Let's uh, add more species. So we've added the carrot species and the fox species to this system. And now if we're studying the population of carrots, the population of bunnies, and the population of foxes and how they all interact with each other, this now is community ecology. Because community ecology is the interaction among populations of multiple species that live together in an area. Um, so those interactions could include things like predation and herbivory. Now we're adding uh, further complexity, making this ecosystem ecology. And an ecosystem was first defined in the early 20th century by an ecologist named Tansley. He said an ecosystem includes not only the organism complex, which means the community of interacting species, but also the whole complex of physical factors forming what we call the environment. So it's, it's all the species and also their interactions with the surrounding environment. So they're breathing in, breathing out, uh, creating wastes, absorbing nutrients from the soil, the bacteria that are breaking down the poop and dead things uh, back into uh, chemicals that can be used by the plants, the sun uh, supplying energy to the plants. All of those processes, transformations and flux of energy and matter are part of what we call ecosystem ecology. So interactions between organisms and the transformation and flux of energy and matter equals ecosystems ecology. All right, so we've got our general examples and definitions of what ecology is, population, community, and ecosystem ecology. Um, now let's take that into the marine environment. Marine means the salt waters of the earth, the ocean. So why should we study ecology in marine systems? It's easier to study the land than it is to study the ocean, so why go to the trouble of studying marine ecosystems? I've got six reasons here. Um, number one, most ecosystems are marine ecosystems. The ocean is big. Um, two, marine ecosystems are different from terrestrial ecosystems. We'll go more into that later. Life began and first diversified in marine ecosystems, so even our own history as humans, uh, traces back to the ocean. Marine ecosystems remain largely unknown because they're harder to study, uh, making them interesting and um, 
fruitful when we do go to the trouble of studying them. Uh, marine ecosystem processes are globally important. They affect human life and vice versa. Uh, and that vice versa is the last one. Human impacts are rapidly changing marine ecosystems and we need to know um, how that's happening. Okay, so my first point was that most ecosystems are marine ecosystems. Uh, this is because oceans cover most of the Earth's surface. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in salt water. And on average, the depth of the ocean is 3,800 meters deep. That's almost four kilometers deep. It's very deep. Uh, the deepest point in the ocean is more than 11,000 meters deep. So. Um, we're not only talking about a lot of surface area, 71% of the Earth's surface, um, but a really large volume because it's not just the sea bottom that has life, but that whole what we call water column from the surface of the ocean all the way down to the bottom is full of life. And so if you're quantifying ecosystems not only by surface area, but also by volume, the uh, by volume the ocean uh, vastly exceeds the size of the other ecosystems of Earth. So in that vast volume of ocean, the conditions are very different from the conditions that we experience on land in the terrestrial environment. Um, so I'll just go factor by factor some of the important differences between the marine ecosystem and the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, number one, the density of water and air is wildly different. The water is three orders of magnitude more dense than air. So one cubic meter of water weighs more than a ton, whereas one cubic meter of air weighs only uh, 1.2 kilograms, which is just um, a couple pounds. Um, in addition to being more dense, water is also more viscous, meaning it's harder to move through, uh, but that makes it easier to be suspended in it, um, uh, whereas you know it's hard to keep yourself up in the air. Birds and some flying insects can do it, but in the ocean, lots and lots of things are um, suspended in the in the medium surrounding them. Um, there is oxygen for breathing in the air and in the ocean, but the levels differ. In the air, the oxygen levels are 210,000 parts per million, which translates to 21%. So 21% of the air is oxygen. So there's always like enough oxygen in the air for air breathing organisms. Um, whereas in the ocean, uh, the oxygen levels vary. Some parts of the ocean have a lot of oxygen, no problem for fish to get oxygen through their gills. Uh, other parts of the ocean have no oxygen at all, and uh, that's um, a big problem for uh, organisms in those areas to get enough oxygen or find a way to live without oxygen. Um, because of the great density of seawater, the pressure uh, underwater is a lot higher than the pressure on the surface of the earth where you're only under the, the atmosphere. So um, the uh, weight of wa uh, just 10 meters of water is equal to the weight of the entire atmosphere. So every time you go 10 meters deeper in the water, it's like adding another entire atmosphere's worth of pressure. So organisms that live deep in the ocean have to uh, be adapted to uh, dealing with those intense pressures. Uh, another thing that is very different between the life at the um, terrestrial surface versus life beneath the sea is the availability of light. Um, on the land surface, the intensity of light in summer is about a thousand micromoles per meter squared per second. You don't need to worry too much about what that uh, units are, but it just means that that's like direct bright sunlight. Whereas um, in the ocean, Organisms are often trying to organisms that need light to grow, like algae and, and seagrasses. They're trying to get by on a lot lower light levels than um, land plants have, and light eventually uh, dims to the point where you can no longer have photosynthesis um, when there's below a certain minimum level of light uh, as you go deeper into the ocean. We'll talk about that more later. All right, so. Um, Another reason to study ecology in marine systems is because marine systems um, have different 
creatures than the land systems. There's, there's a wide variety of life in the ocean as there is on land, um, but sort of like the patterns of diversity of life are different in the ocean and on land. So there are actually more species on land than in the ocean, but there are more of the broader categories of life in the ocean than on land. So the ocean has more phyla of life um, and the land has more species of life. So you, here you can see that there's um, uh, 32 phyla of life in the ocean, whereas in the land environment there's only 12 phyla of life, even though there are many species. Most of the species on land are arthropods, so bugs. So um, that's arthropod is just one phylum. So even though we have lots and lots of species, they're mostly bugs. And so our diversity at the broader, or what we call higher taxonomic levels, is um, uh, most in the ocean. This figure from a publication in the scientific literature shows um, some of that broad pattern of diversity differences between the marine and terrestrial environment. So um, the branches here that are in blue are phyla that originated in the ocean and the branches in green are phyla that originated in the terrestrial environment. So you can see most of the broad branches of the tree of life um, are things that, that branched out in the ocean and consequently you know that phylum level diversity of life is higher in the ocean even though these groups here um, the uh, some of the groups that are present on land like the arthropods are super duper diverse on land so uh, we can talk in more detail about why that might be later another big difference in ecology between the ocean and the land is in how, in the food chain so the food chain is sort of the conceptual way of understanding how energy is transferred from the plants, which get their energy from the sun, up to the uh, animals and other organisms that uh, don't get their energy from the sun but need to eat or decompose things to get their energy. So um, uh, the food chains, both in the ocean and on land, need to have some kind of plant or plant-like organism at the base. Um, and plants need water, light, and nutrients to grow. Uh, in the uh, ocean, there's always plenty of water, obviously, but the nutrients and light tend to be limiting factors determining how much plants can grow. Um, whereas on land, um, there's usually plenty of nutrients and light, but there can be limiting amounts of water and that will determine whether there's a lot of vegetation like a rainforest or not much like a desert. So um, the limiting factor is really different between the marine and the terrestrial environments. Um, also the type of plants are different in the ocean and on land. On land you have mostly multicellular autotrophs, so big plants like trees, whereas in the ocean it's unicellular autotrophs, which means small um, algae. Uh, there are some larger plants and plant-like organisms in the ocean like kelp and, and mangroves, but for the most part it's microscopic single-celled algae. Um, on land, there usually aren't that many levels in the food chain from the plants to the top predators, but in the ocean there tend to be more levels in the food chain, more steps to get from the primary producers at the base of the food chain up to the top predators at the top of the food chain. In the ocean, the trend is for each level in the food chain to have larger organisms, like from tiny algae to somewhat bigger plankton that eat the algae, to small fish that eat those plankton, to larger fish that eat those plankton, and larger fish, and so on. And there's this general trend of increasing size as you go up the food chain. But it's not always like that on land, where oftentimes the plant eaters are actually smaller than the plants. Um, and these are general trends. There are, of course, exceptions to these rules. Um, finally, there's a difference in lifestyle between the land organisms and the ocean organisms. On land, 
almost all the animals are mobile. They move around because you have to move around to find food and escape predators and things like that. Uh, however, in the ocean, you have some animals that move, like fish, uh, but you also have some animals that stay in place for their entire life, what we call sessile animals like sea anemones or barnacles that just stay stuck in one spot. So why is it that in the ocean you can have these sessile animals that will like just spend their whole life stuck to a rock, um, whereas on land most of the animals have to move around? Um, and can you think of any animals on land that are sessile, that just spend their whole life stuck in one place? Well, um, I think that one of the reasons there are so many more sessile animals in the ocean is, r relates back to the density of the seawater relative to air. Since seawater is dense, there are many particles of food, plankton, uh, and detritus that can drift along in the seawater. and can drift with the currents and be snagged uh, passively by sessile filter feeding organisms like an anemone or a barnacle. Whereas on land, there aren't that many particles that are just drifting through the air. You're not going to be uh, sitting on your back porch and have like a hamburger float into your mouth. But um, for an ocean organism, you kind of can have that. Um, the, the one example I might be able to think of for a sessile terrestrial animal isn't exactly sessile, but if you think of like um, uh, a spider that sits in its web and um, waits for food particles to sort of come by and get stuck in the web, um, even though the spider itself can move, um, it's, it's kind of like a sessile organism in that it's just sort of sitting there and waiting for particles of food to drift by and get stuck, not in its tentacles, but in its sticky web. So um, that's the closest that I can think of to a sessile terrestrial animal. If you guys can think of a better example of a sessile terrestrial animal, why don't you let me know? All right, another reason to study the ocean is because marine opposite, uh ecosystems uh, are largely unknown and there's sort of like that mystery and joy of discovering things that nobody else has ever known. So some of the uh, great relatively recent uh, contributions to science have come from studying the ocean and I'm highlighting a few of those here. Uh, the 1825 voyage of the HMS Beagle which was a scientific research boat that Charles Darwin was on as a young man. Um, his discoveries of uh, and descriptions of ocean life helped him formulate his uh, theory of evolution which is hugely influential and now is the basis of all modern biology. Um, so that super duper important uh, contribution to science came in part from study of the ocean. Uh, later in the 19th century there was an ocean voyage specifically to study the deep ocean on the HMS Challenger and much of our knowledge of deep ocean life and uh, organisms comes from that expedition. Uh, and in the 20th century when scuba diving was invented by Jacques Cousteau and others, uh, our understanding of ocean ecosystems really increased rapidly as we were able to get under there and study things that we hadn't really been able to get a close look at before. Uh, submarine technology like the deep sea submarine Alvin which in 1964 began exploring a much deeper in the ocean than we'd really been able to uh, look closely at before uh, increased our understanding of the sort of hitherto unseen uh, parts of the ocean and we're continuing that trend of exploration now but more with these remotely operated submarines which are less dangerous for the um, people um, and they're cheaper to operate so we're able to explore more of the seafloor. Uh, another reason that marine ecosystems are super important to study is because they really affect human life a lot. Uh, they affect all life and humans are life so they affect us. Um, about 50% of the global total primary production, which means the production of living material uh, and uh, oxygen, which is um, also produced when living material is produced by plants, um, about 50% of that 
happens in the ocean. So you've probably heard of other ecosystems like rainforest being the lungs of the planet. Um, and those terrestrial ecosystems are, of course, very, very important. But we shouldn't discount the uh, huge proportion of that global primary production that happens in the ocean in the form mostly of uh, algae. Uh, and because there's so much primary production going on, that means that huge amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide are being processed by those marine organisms. And there's this exchange between the ocean and atmosphere of those gases, which is hugely important not only for the productivity of life, but also for the uh, regulation of the climate and the gas composition of the atmosphere. The ocean organisms and the cycles of um, transformation of energy and, and materials that they're involved in are also really important for the cycling of nutrients and pollutants. So nutrients, things like nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, tend to flow into the ocean uh, from runoff from land and they can be processed in different ways that uh, sometimes have good effects that uh, increase the productivity of uh, fish and things like that, but they can also have harmful effects. Uh, in the picture on the right hand side here, we see a bloom of red tide, a type of uh, harmful algae uh, that's showing up in the satellite imagery where there's um, a huge bloom of this harmful algae off the coast of southwest Florida. Uh, so um, resources that humans use uh, can be sustainably provided by the ocean, like uh, fisheries would be one example of a renewable resource that the oceans can provide. And there are lots of other economic and aesthetic values of marine species and habitats. Uh, so they're, they're really important to sort of our well-being as humans in many ways. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're sort of loving the oceans to death. And, and human impacts are really changing marine ecosystems in some ways that are making marine ecosystems less capable of providing benefits to us. Uh, overfishing is one. We're taking the fish out of the ocean and now there's not so many fish for us to take. Uh, eutrophication is um, a type of pollution with excess nutrients that's a big problem. The pollution of the atmosphere with carbon dioxide also affects the oceans by causing climate change. And the carbon dioxide actually gets into the ocean and causes another problem called ocean acidification. Uh, and those are just a few of the broad categories of human impacts on the ocean. Overfishing is kind of hard to see because we look out at the ocean from the shore and it looks like it's vast and limitless. But if we look at the data on how many fish there are in the ocean, there are much, much uh, fewer fish than there used to be uh, only uh, half a century ago. So uh, this is true in every ocean of the world. There are far fewer fish than there used to be. And it's just a, a stark and devastating pattern. Uh, and this is because uh, technology now allows us to fish in every part of the ocean no matter how far from shore and this fishing hasn't been well regulated so we we really decimated the stocks of open ocean fishes as well as coastal fishes another really devastating impact that humans have had on the ocean is pollution of the nearshore ocean with excess nutrients that are related to our activities on land. So certain things that humans do on land, particularly a lot of farming practices, lead to the release of a lot of nutrients in the runoff water. And those nutrients overstimulate algae in the ocean and the overpopulation of algae leads to harmful effects, including depletion of oxygen in the water underneath the algae bloom, uh, which creates what we call dead zones. The world's most famous dead zone is in the Gulf of Mexico, um, where the waters from the Mississippi River empty out, delivering huge amounts of nutrients from all the farmland in the central United States. So in addition to nutrient pollution, a major type of pollution affecting the ocean is carbon dioxide pollution. And um, human activities generate carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. And that has multiple effects. Uh, one effect is uh, enhancing the greenhouse effect and causing the climate to get warmer and, and change. Another effect is diffusing into the ocean and causing the oceans to become more acidic. And we'll talk later in this course about the interesting ripple effects of these two um, 
to changes caused by carbon dioxide on the ocean. All right, so uh, we've probably already sort of given the message that ecology and marine ecosystems are complicated and it might be a little bit intimidating to think about the really complex and variable phenomenon uh, going on in the ocean where there's thousands and thousands of species it's a huge area there's a lot of variation from place to place um, and time to time and so because as ecologists we're trying to get a grasp on these really broad complicated and variable phenomenon um, it's uh, it's really easy to sort of slip into the trap of um, being vague and, and sloppy because we can't like characterize things perfectly and exactly. Um, we might start throwing around these these vague and sloppy terms like this fella here is using. Uh, the ocean has these like energy vibrations that totally synergize the cycle of life. So you just gotta like go with the flow, you know. Um, and so uh, that might capture the way that you feel about the ocean, but it doesn't really give any usable scientific understanding of the ocean. And in this class, we want to learn how to um, uh, say, you know, useful, real things about the ocean. So we have to be very careful that we um, describe what's going on in the ocean in a careful, organized manner um, using theory that makes logical sense using analysis of data that uh, can uh, clearly evaluate whether those theories are, are true or, or false or sometimes true and we want to describe things in a clear way using the correct words um, so I'll be teaching you throughout this class a lot of ways to add some organization and clarity to the complexity of the ocean which you might be sort of at a loss for words to describe um, now. Uh, so the first example of how we can sort of apply a system of organization to something that's big and vague and seemingly disorganized is taxonomic organization. So taxonomy is the classification of life and it's based on Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, basically, we group organisms by what their closest relatives are, and um, we have uh, the the most specific grouping of organisms is species. Uh, species is very similar to the word specific, um, so it's easy to remember that species is the most specific classification of life. Um, but uh, it's necessary sometimes to um, group life into broader uh, groupings that include um, related species and so we have these successively broad broader categories of life uh, all the way up to the very broadest categories of all so um, the, the broadest category of life of all is the domain and there's only three domains that all life on earth falls into there's the eukarya the um, uh, bacteria and the archaea, um, so three three of the broadest, oldest branches of the tree of life, um, and humans and manatees are in the domain eukarya. Uh, we have eukaryotic cells, which is why we're in that domain. Um, the next broadest category, uh, which is um, within domain, things are classified into kingdoms. And so within the domain eukarya, manatees are in the kingdom animalia, uh, as are all other animals. Um, within the kingdom animalia, uh, within any kingdom, things are classified into phyla. Um, and so manatees are in the phylum chordata, along with all other animals that have um, uh, a backbone-like structure. Um, within the chordates, uh, Manatees are in the class Mammalia, so that's the mammals. Uh, humans are also in that class, um, and uh, humans, uh, sorry, manatees are in the order Sirenia. Uh, so Sirenia means the manatees. Uh, so the manatees and dugongs and some extinct relatives of manatees and dugongs are in this order within the order Sirenia within the class Mammalia. Um, getting more specific still, uh, manatees are in the family Trichechidae, and the genus Trichechus 
uh, species Monatus. All right, so back to the species concept. Um, species concept is super important. It, uh, when I say a species, I mean all the individual organisms in the world that fit within the taxonomic classification of that species. So uh, this species is called uh, blue fish. Um, so one organism, uh, one of these blue fish, we would call it an individual uh, of that blue fish species. Um, but if it's a locally interbreeding group of individuals of that same species, we would call that a population. So maybe um, this is like within a particular bay or lake where these fish live. And we would call that the, the population of blue fish in uh, Jones Lake. Um, and then there's this level that's higher than uh, population, but it's still within the species. And it's called metapopulation. Um, so populations are usually somewhat isolated, but not totally isolated, like fish in lakes. Uh, the, the fish within one lake would definitely be like a population of fish, but um, it's not the entire species uh, of, uh, it's not the entirety of that species. And so there might be some connections between the fish populations in different lakes, maybe through streams that connect the lakes, and occasionally fish from one lake might be able to get into the other lake and interbreed with the in other individuals of that same species in that lake. Um, and so like that, uh, um, sort of interconnected uh, group of populations is called a meta population. And so you could kind of consider humans to be a meta population because we mostly uh, sort of interbreed within our countries and, and states and, and communities. Um, but sometimes we'll, you know, someone from Ireland might marry someone from India, or, or, and there's like mixing of. Um, different uh, individuals uh, within um, geographically separated populations. All right, okay, so um, what do people who study populations actually do? Uh, let's talk about marine population ecology. So marine ecologists, if they're focused at the population level, can study any of these things, and that would be considered marine population ecology. So you could uh, study the abundance of organisms, which it seems like a really simple thing, like, oh, you're just going to go out there and count fish. Um, but it's it's more complicated than you might think, and, and we'll talk about um, how scientists study the abundance of fish when we talk about fisheries ecology later in the semester. Uh, besides just counting the number of individuals, uh, we look at the age and size structure. So you can see in this uh, population that I've uh, drawn here that they're not all the same size, um, and they're probably therefore not all the same age. And so uh, is the population mostly made up of a lot of juveniles, or are they just a few juveniles and mostly adults? Uh, those are things that population ecologists can study, and we call that age and size structure. Uh, geographic range and spatial distribution is an aspect of population ecology. So where are the organisms most abundant? Um, what are the ways that they sort of uh, move and um, migrate uh, throughout the year? Things like that. Uh, and we can also study changes in the population size or age and size structure um, due to births, deaths, and immigration and emigration maybe between different populations within the metapopulation. An example of population ecology is um, studies of the Goliath grouper, this large, uh, largest grouper in the Atlantic Ocean, um, but it's very, uh, well, it, it was very endangered and their populations are recovering now thanks to a moratorium. So population ecologists um, were studying their populations and realizing that they were about to go extinct due to overfishing. Uh, they banned fishing on uh, these things, and now the populations are recovering. And that's a, a good example of population ecology applied to saving a particular species from extinction. All right, so there is going to be math in this class. And some of the math that I want everybody to know is the math of population growth. So um, the, there's two basic types of population growth equations that we'll refer to a lot during this class. One is exponential growth, 
um, and the other is logistic population growth. So a lot of the variables in the two equations are the same between both the equations, which makes it easier. The first variable that is really important to know is the P. So P, as you might imagine, stands for population. It's just basically how many individuals there are in that population. Um, the next letter that you need to know is lowercase r. Lowercase r is an intrinsic rate of increase, basically like the birth rate minus the death rate. And you know, assuming the birth rate's higher than the death rate, the intrinsic rate of increase will be some positive number. Um, and so if you want to uh, find out what the change in the number of individuals is per some unit time, uh, dp over dt, um, then you just take the population size and multiply it by the intrinsic rate of growth and then you can figure out um, what sort of like the percent increase in the population is going to be using this uh, um, equation here. So one of the interesting things about the exponential growth equation is that because population size is one of the terms in the equation, the bigger the population is, the bigger the rate of growth is going to be. Because if you times, uh, the r is always a constant, and if you times the r by a large number, you get a large number. So basically that means that the bigger the population gets, the faster the population grows. That's kind of the scary thing about exponential population growth. Uh, as you get bigger, you grow faster, which gets you bigger, and then you grow faster and faster and faster, and that's why you have this sort of skyrocketing um, growth of the population. So exponential population growth does occur in nature, but it can't last forever because if it lasted forever, then the population would overflow the earth. Um, so obviously something eventually has to cut off this growth. And that um, could be a lot of different things. Uh, and, and that is what is captured by this next kind of equation, the logistic population growth equation. And so a lot of the uh, logistic population growth equation is exactly the same as the exponential population growth equation, which we already explained. It's got the intrinsic rate of population growth and the population size. But it has this other part of the equation, this part that's uh, in parentheses here, and what that does is it puts the brakes on population growth when the population gets close to a certain size that we call K. K uh, is referred to as the carrying capacity of the environment. It's sort of like the maximum population size that that environment can support. And as the population size of the organisms gets close to K, um, there's maybe not as much food or not as much space for the organisms and their uh, either their birth rates slow down or their death rate increases so that their population is no longer uh, increasing. And basically this term when P equals K becomes zero and you have zero population growth when you reach K so it just levels off. Um, there are slightly different forms, well, very different forms of the equations when you're trying to express population growth as a function of time. So uh, as a function of time means like as a function of, of t, is, which is our variable for time. Um, so if you wanted to actually use a spreadsheet program like Microsoft Excel to make a graph of population growth over time, you would put in equation uh, you would put in an equation like this and you could generate a bunch of data points that you would graph uh, to, to create a curve like this for exponential growth or you put in this equation and uh, you'd be able to um, get a curve that would level off and produce uh, logistic or restricted population growth. All right, so we're done with the math for a little while, and we're moving on to the next level of ecology. So we talked about populations. Now we have to talk about when there's populations of multiple species in an area, and those uh, populations of multiple species are interacting. That is what we call a community. So we no longer just have one species, the bluefish. We've got the bluefish, the greenfish, and the redfish. So in community ecology in the ocean, um, as with community ecology anywhere, uh, 
we have to remember the three C's of community ecology. So it's nice because community starts with a C, and then these three aspects of community ecology also start with a C, so hopefully that helps you remember them. Uh, the first C is competition, second C, consumption, third C, cooperation. And I'll explain and give you some examples of consumption, con competition, and cooperation on the next slides. Okay, so competition is when two or more organisms are trying to obtain a limiting resource. So this is a picture of a coral reef ecosystem, um, and you might be able to spot some potential competition here. So take a look. Now probably the first thing that you saw is that there's two sharks in this picture, uh, and they're two different species of sharks, um, but they probably both eat fish and therefore they might be competing for the same fish and there's a limited amount of fish on the reef so these two sharks are in competition for a limiting resource the number of fish on the reef um, but you uh, may have also noticed that this reef is crowded with corals of different types and the corals are also in competition they are competing for space as they try to grow over each other. They're competing for light because they have symbiotic algae in their tissues and they need to get uh, light to those algae. And they may be competing for food particles that they filter out of the water. So um, even though it's kind of a slow motion type of competition, there's competition among the non-moving organisms like corals, uh, just as there is among the more sentient and active organisms like the sharks. So uh, I mentioned competition among non-moving organisms and some of the competitive dynamics that have been most studied in the ocean are actually the dynamics between simple non-moving organisms uh, that live on the rocky shores of many parts of the world. Uh, I'm talking here about barnacles. So uh, there's a famous scientist named Connell, who we will study later in the course. Um, we'll study some of his work. And uh, one of the organisms that Connell studied was the barnacle. Uh, and there's actually more than one species of barnacle in the world. Uh, there were two species that Connell was studying, Catalamus and Balanus. Um, and barnacles compete for space. So um, their competition can kind of take the form of one barnacle growing over the other and crowding it out or sort of wedging it off the rock as it grows. It's a slow motion competition, but it's nonetheless a life or death competition. Uh, and the competition between these two can determine which type of barnacle you find in which spot along the rocky shoreline. So um, it turns out that uh, Balanus is a stronger competitor for space it can, uh, with these sort of like rough bits along the edge of its uh, shell, uh, bulldoze away the other barnacles and um, crowd them out and take over the space. So it's a superior competitor for space uh, and therefore um, it will take over from the other barnacle. But the other barnacle, it does have uh, one advantage um, and that's that it can tolerate drying out better so even though it can't fight off the um, balanus when it comes to the battle for space, it can live in some spaces that um, high on the rocks that are too dry for the um, other type of barnacle. And um, this relates to a concept uh, called the fundamental niche and the realized niche. So the Catalamus barnacle could potentially live anywhere along the rocky shoreline, um, but it's and they call that its fundamental niche, but its realized niche is a more narrow range because uh, competition uh, excludes it from this lower down area where the tougher balanus barnacles uh, wedge it off the rocks. All right, we're on to the third C of community ecology, and that is consumption, when one organism eats another. So these life-or-death, predator-prey interactions are some of the most interesting and exciting parts of marine ecology, um, not only because of the drama of life and death, but because of the interesting effects that consumption can have at the overall ecosystem level. So in this picture, 
here we have um, two lakes that are um, very similar but they're both surrounded by woods but one lake is green and the other lake is clear and blue and the only difference between these lakes is that one of them has uh, four levels in its food chain and the other has three levels in its food chain and that uh, has this effect which changes the amount of algae in the water so this uh, picture here represents the algae in the water the algae in the water are what makes the water look green if there's a lot in it um, and so uh, I want you to sort of pause the slide here and see if you can figure out based on logic which of these food chains probably goes with which lake okay so hopefully you've thought about it now I'm going to explain it so um, in a food chain uh, the algae are eaten by the um, algae eating plankton like this amphipod here uh, and the algae eating plankton are eaten by small fish now if you have small fish in the lake they eat all the algae eating plankton that they can and therefore there won't be very many um, of these algae eating plankton especially if there's nothing to regulate the population of uh, the the algae uh, of the small fish um, and so if there aren't very many of these algae eating plankton because they're all getting eaten by small fish then there will be a lot of algae so this three level food chain is actually the food chain that goes with this lake that is full of algae so because the algae eaters are being suppressed the algae is abundant and you have this green algae fold situation uh, in the other lake though the predatory fish eat the small fish so there are not very many small fish and that means that um, the amount of uh, things that the small fish ate uh, actually increases because they don't have to worry too much about getting eaten by small fish because there aren't that many small fish the small fish are getting eaten by the big fish uh, so there's a lot of these things and these things eat the heck out of the algae and therefore they keep the algae at a low level so this food chain with low levels of algae is the one that goes with this clear lake here so there's an interesting implication of this understanding of uh, community ecology and the effects of consumption for managing lake ecosystems and that is that having a fourth level in your food chain having predatory fish could actually help to suppress the algae blooms now this is a little bit oversimplified there are other factors that can affect algae blooms as well like the amount of nutrients um, but this is an important piece of knowledge for understanding the uh, causes of um, uh, ripple effects of the food chain that can result in uh, algae blooms okay so I was talking about ripple effects through the food chain and they can get a lot more complicated uh, than the simple ones in those three and four level food chains that I was just showing because re in in the real world we're not dealing with simple food chains we're really dealing with these more complex relationships of what eats what which we call food webs and we uh, illustrate with these so-called food web diagrams um, so they're basically just uh, sort of mapping out what eats what and there's lots and lots of interesting interconnections and one of the things that these diagrams help us do is predict what might happen if we uh, add or remove a particular species um, to the web and how those effects will ripple through the rest of the web and we can um, figure this out through experiments and mathematical models and um, observations of nature uh, and the food web diagram and an understanding of consumptive interactions in community ecology is what allows us to do that okay so the third C of marine community ecology is the happy one it's cooperation so cooperation is when two or more organisms are interacting in a way that benefits all of them uh, so it's not like there's a winner or a loser they're both benefiting 
and the one of the best examples of this from marine ecology is the symbiotic interaction between zooxanthellae which are microscopic algae that live inside the meat of corals and the coral animal itself which you see here with the tentacles and mouth and the body cavity um, so the uh, coral is an animal it eats like most animals do by catching particles of food and, and stuffing them in its mouth um, but it has this other way of getting nutrition as well and that's with the algae that live within its tissues they grow um, as all plants do by um, using the power of sunlight to combine uh, chemicals that they get from the environment into a form that becomes food uh, and then they can share some of that with the coral so the coral gets an extra dose of food that the algae produce and the algae gets the benefit of living within the protective um, covering of the of the coral so we'll talk more about the um, complicated benefits and relationship bet between uh, zooxanthellae and coral when we do our coral reef unit later so uh, now we're looking at a cold water ecosystem this one doesn't have corals in it but it has this giant algae called kelp and uh, also obviously has a lot of fish uh, so looking at this picture I want you to think about some of the cooperative relationships that might exist in this kelp bed you can pause the slide here all right well uh, one of the cooperative relationships that may exist is um, the kelp can benefit the fish by providing them sort of a hiding place from potential predators and the fish can benefit the kelp by eating uh, small invertebrates off the kelp that might otherwise eat the kelp. So there could be protecting the kelp from uh, invertebrate herbivores. Um, the fish also, when they poop and pee, release nutrients into the water that may help fertilize the kelp. Um, and there are, perhaps you came up with some uh, additional uh, ways that these organisms might be benefiting each other as well uh, and there are many okay so we're moving on to the highest level of complexity of ecology now what we call ecosystem ecology so ecosystem ecology addresses the interactions among organisms and the environment including what I'm calling the transformation and flux of energy and matter so transformation and flux are sort of complicated words so let's take a second to uh, explain what I'm, we mean by transformation so transformation is when you're changing something from one form to another so organisms can change matter from one form to another and in, that's really important in the environment uh, and and one example is this organism trichodesmium which is a chain forming cyanobacterium so it's a, a prokaryotic organism that is photosynthetic it gets its energy from the Sun so it's, it's a plant like organism um, but it has this ability to take uh, N2 this form of nitrogen which is abundant in the atmosphere and ocean but is not usable by most organisms and it can transform that using the power of the Sun into ammonia which is a much uh, more readily absorbed form of nitrogen that the trichodesmium and other algae can use so uh, the fact that this trichodesmium transforms uh, this matter nitrogen from an unusable to a usable form has huge consequences for the productivity of the ocean water uh, it allows other algae to grow and supports a food chain where there would not be much life if it weren't for this important transformation of nitrogen which is carried out by this particular organism trichodesmium okay uh, another example of ecosystem ecology this time focusing on flux uh, flux is the movement of matter and energy uh, within and between ecosystems so the flux that is covered in this example is the flux of nutrients from bird poop to plants on the islands where the birds nest so people actually measured this flux they um, 
quantify the number of birds, how much each bird pooped, and how much nutrients there were in each bird poop, uh, and calculated that 360 grams per meter squared of guano was being uh, transferred as, from the birds to the um, surface of the island there. And this caused like lush, lush plants to grow on the island. Um, then the flux changed because Arctic foxes were introduced to this island in the uh, North Atlantic. And um, the Arctic foxes did as you would expect them to do, and they ate up most of the birds, baby birds, and eggs. So there were far, far fewer birds nesting on the island after the foxes were introduced, and the flux rate of bird poop to the ground of the island went from 360 down to 6 grams per meter squared of guano. And so there was far, far less available nutrients to the plants on the island, and the plant community sort of withered away from this lush community to just a few meager plants that were not able to uh, grow and sustain themselves very well uh, because they didn't have a lot of nutrients. So this um, it, example is cool because uh, it relates to the sort of community ecology thing where the food web changed because Arctic foxes were introduced, but then it also involves the whole ecosystem because that change also affected the flux of uh, energy and material in this environment um, by reducing the amount of bird poop transferred to the plants. Okay, so um, all of these complicated interactions that we've talked about in ecology that can occur at the population, community, and ecosystem level result in really interesting patterns of life in the marine environment. So I've just got a picture of the, uh, a plaid pattern there to um, give you an example of a pattern. Uh, you would probably not see a plaid pattern in the marine environment, but, but that's just an example. Uh, all right, so um, sp it turns out that species in the ocean are not randomly distributed. It's not like uh, you could cast your fishing line in the ocean anywhere in the world and have an equal chance of catching any species of fish in the world. No, there uh, is a lot of patterning in what species live where, um, what places have a high density of life and diversity of life, what, what, spe what places do not. Um, so it's, it's not random at all. There are these really strong patterns of what species occur where and what places have a lot of life or what places have one species or another. Um, and you can see the patterns from really small scales, like within a habitat, there might be one uh, part of the reef that has more of something than another, uh, all the way up to the global scale uh, where you're looking at like what species are found in the Pacific Ocean versus the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, to explain these patterns, we, we need to think about population, community, and ecosystem ecology and think in a really big picture way, uh, not just about what conditions are like in the present, but uh, think back uh, in time as well. So one of the concepts that's most helpful for understanding how life is um, patterned in the ocean, uh, what species are found where, why some environments are different than the others, is the concept of an abiotic gradient. So a gradient means a change, like a progressive change from one condition to another. And so I'm visually illustrating gradients with these so-called color gradients where we're blending like from orange to purple or uh, blue to white or white to black. Um, and so just as you can have sort of a blend of colors, you could have a blend from one type of condition to another. And this is really common in the marine environment. Uh, and there are lots of conditions which can form gradients. So you could have a temperature gradient uh, where, you know, going over some distance from the surface of the water to the bottom or from the equator to the poles, you would have a, a temperature gradient where you're going from hot to cold water conditions. You could have a gradient in salinity as you went from you know fresh water to salt water. There'd be a transition in a gradual transition in conditions forming a salinity gradient. There could be a gradient of light, uh, which is very important um, from the sunlit waters of the surface to the lightless waters of the deep. 
there could be gradients in the amount of uh, chemicals in the water, like um, nitrogen and phosphorus, which we call nutrients. Uh, waters that have more nutrients might be more productive in terms of algae growth than waters that add less nutrients. Um, and there could even be gradients in the physical conditions of the water as with respect to energy. So um, there could be some waters that are really rough and wavy or swept by strong currents, uh, and those might transition into calmer waters where there, there's less uh, wave and, and, and currents mixing up the water. And all of these abiotic, meaning non-biological gradients in the environment, affect the life in interesting and complicated ways. Uh, I should just say that sometimes scientists use the word cline as a suffix uh, to mean gradient. So you might see the word thermocline, which means temperature gradient, or halocline, which means salinity gradient. Um, and when cline is used, it usually refers to where there's like a sharp gradient in conditions, um, where there'll be like a major transition from um, uh, one condition to another within a, a certain range of the environment. So if there's like an abrupt temperature transition at some depth in the water, we would call that the thermocline. All right, so these abiotic gradients are abiotic, right? They, they don't involve life yet, um, but they, they do affect life. And because of the underlying abiotic gradients, you end up with these patterns in life and the patterns in, of difference in life are what we call biotic zonation. Biotic means having to do with life. So um, that's the definition of biotic zonation. So let's give some examples of biotic zonation. Um, there are changes in the intertidal community along the elevation gradient. So the intertidal zone is the zone that is sometimes underwater when the tide is high, but is also exposed to air when the tide is low. Um, so there are these interesting organisms that are adapted to being exposed to the air at low tide, but then covered again at high tide. Um, but different organisms are more or less tolerant to being in or out of the water. So depending on how high you are along the shoreline and how often you're underwater, um, there will be different organisms present there. So the different uh, biotic zones develop at the different um, elevations along the shoreline in response to that underlying air exposure gradient. Uh, there are gradients in coral reefs. Um, one of the things that changes within a coral reef is the amount of light. So in the shallow parts of the reef there's a lot of life and organisms that flourish in very bright light will be present there, whereas deeper down um, things that can get by with less light or don't need light at all will become more prevalent uh, and those affect the uh, zones. Um, there are changes in an estuary in response to the salinity gradient. So um, fishes that live in fresh water will be found near where the river comes into the estuary, and um, fishes that need a saltwater environment will be found near the mouth of the estuary with, where it enters into the ocean. Uh, and my final example here is even in the open ocean away from the shoreline, there can be variation in the amount of nutrients in the water. And as you transition from an area with high nutrients to an area with low nutrients, along that nutrient gradient, there will be changes in the amount and types of plankton. And nekton, which means uh, swimming organisms like fishes, will also change in response to those uh, gradients in nutrients. This picture of a rocky cliff in the state of Maine shows biotic zonation along the intertidal exposure gradient. So the underlying abiotic here is gradient here is the degree of exposure to air. So at the lower end of this uh, rocky cliff, the organisms are, oops, let's get a pen. At the lower end, the organisms are underwater most of the time and rarely exposed to air. At the upper end here, the organisms are never underwater and constantly exposed to air. And in between, there's sort of a range of different um, intensities of exposure to air, which sort of dictates the biotic zonation. So here you can see this sort of dark band of algae, blue-green algae that grows on the rocks. It's actually a prokaryotic organism, cyanobacteria. 
Uh, it's very hardy and can stand being dried out most of the time. So it's that's why it's the only organism that grows there. And then below that, you start to see this uh, white dusting of barnacles. Barnacles have a hard shell that can protect them from drying out. Uh, and then mixed in with the barnacles, pretty much up to the top of the barnacle zone, you see this brown algae. Um, uh, this brown algae is in the genus Fucus, and it's relatively tolerant of drying out, so it sort of forms its own zone. Uh, then the brown algae, the Fucus, sort of fades into some other species of algae, including red and green algaes, which are less tolerant of drying out. Um, and uh, at the lowest levels, there might be some kelps and other types of algae that are not able to dry out at all. So you see these different um, biotic zones, uh, which you could name or number, uh, that develop in relation to the abiotic gradient here. This is sort of a technical diagram that describes an abiotic, uh, gr the underlying abiotic forces here. Uh, and then it also describes the biotic zones. And so each zone is characterized not necessarily by just one species, but by a set of species. And so the three zones of the intertidal are the uh, upper supralittoral fringe, which is mostly above the water level, which includes lichens, ephemeral algae, and uh, these two species of snails. Um, then sort of the mid littoral zone where you've got barnacles, mussels, uh, fucoid algae, limpets, which are a type of snail that has a non-coiled shell. Uh, and then the infra littoral fringe, which is where it's mostly wet and rarely exposed to air, where there's red algae and some kelps. Um, and uh, then here they list the different um, things that are sort of the underlying forces that dictate what species can survive in those zones. And so you can see um, that probably the most important one is desiccation plus environmental fluctuations. You can see that that increases in intensity as you get higher on the shore. So desiccation means drying out. So basically there's more effect of drying out when you're high on the shore uh, and less effect of drying out when you're low on the shore where you're underwater most of the time. Um, some other things change in different ways. The water movement, which is the effect of waves, is not felt very much when you're high on the shore because the water rarely reaches this high. And it's not felt very much when you're way low down because you're sort of beneath the influence of the waves. And so the effect of water movement is kind of biggest when you're at a, a mid-level on the shore here. And organisms might be influenced by getting knocked off the rocks by the uh, waves if they're at that level. So it's not just the stress of drying out that needs to be considered, it's also the other abiotic forces like the water energy force. Uh, the availability of light is also a factor. So if you're really deep down, some of the algae might not have enough light to grow. Um, and then in addition to these abiotic forces, there are um, biological influences that can sort of add another layer of complexity to understanding what species can live where. There might be things like predation, grazing, and competition that can also kind of affect what species end up living in these zones. If there's a lot of uh, grazing pressure from limpets, for example, um, there might be less of certain algaes in that zone uh, where the limpets are eating them. So to explain the zonation patterns, you need to think of the underlying abiotic factors as well as the um, responses of the organisms to those factors based on their biological characteristics and their interactions with other organisms. So it gets pretty complicated and interesting, as you can see here. All right. Uh, another type of biotic gradient that is not as compressed into a small space as the intertidal gradient, but is no less important, is the estuarine salinity gradient and the corresponding biotic zonation. So estuaries throughout the world have different species depending on the different levels of salinity in the different parts of the estuary. And in Florida, there's sort of an easily characterized set of species that you find in the different zones of the estuary. The saltiest zone of the estuary, where it's uh, basically ocean water, is called the euhaline zone. Uh, and there's a certain set of species that lives in that very salty or euhaline zone. The polyhaline zone is fairly salty, but um, somewhat more brackish, and it has different species. The mesohaline zone is um, uh, variable and uh, in salinity and only species that can tolerate uh, 
variable mix of fresh and salt water would live there. The oligohaline zone is mostly fresh with just a little bit of salt. It has its own unique life. And then that fades into the truly fresh water zone where you have um, species that can't tolerate salt water at all. One complexity to understanding abiotic gradients and biotic zonation is the fact that abiotic gradients aren't always constant in time. Conditions like salinity or temperature can actually vary over time. And so if you're in a, a place like an estuary, uh, you don't define the salinity just by what the average salinity is. Um, but you have to consider the range uh, above and below that average salinity that might also be experienced at that spot. And so an organism that's trying to live at this spot in the estuary has to be able to deal not just with what the average salinity is, but with that whole range of conditions. And so if it's a mobile organism like a fish, maybe it can swim away. Um, but if it's something that's stuck in place, it would have to just sit there and take whatever salinity there was at that time. So um, they call the sort of range of conditions that are uh, that a single spot experiences the um, regime of conditions. So you can see that the regime of salinity conditions in the middle part of an estuary is a wide range, whereas if you're close to the river, it's mostly fresh most of the time. If you're close to the ocean, it's mostly salt of the time. So it's a narrower range that the species have to deal with. So these uh, factors in the environment um, we've seen with the intertidal and the estuarine example how they can affect what species are found uh, in a, a different parts of a local area sort of at a small scale but when we think about the patterns of what species are found in what places at the pl planetary scale we have to not just consider the present uh, abiotic conditions of that area we also have to consider uh, other factors, um, uh, including historical factors, um, things that occurred long ago in the past and may have affected what species are able to be present in that habitat today. Um, so for example, if you look at a coral reef environment in um, Australia versus a coral reef environment in the Caribbean, there might not be that much difference in the salinity, temperature, and other physical factors of the environment, and yet almost none of the species will be the same in those two places. And it's not because the environments are different today, but it's because of the sort of historical differences and the millions of years of separation of those two oceans uh, that have sort of led to uh, different branches in the evolutionary tree and different species arrivals and diversifications in those two areas. So that you have just a totally different set of species in the Australian habitat than you do in the Caribbean habitat, even though the modern day environmental conditions of those habitats might be very similar. Um, so understanding these broad scale biogeographical patterns, we really do have to look back in time and uh, sort of be paleontologists uh, and evolutionary biologists to understand the reasons why certain species are found in certain places and not other places. So the question, for example, of why there are no polar bears in Antarctica and no penguins in the Arctic um, cannot be answered just by looking at the temperatures and stuff in the two places. Uh, it, it's more because of the uh, historical long separation of Antarctica from the, the other continents. So the polar bears in the Arctic evolved from brown bears that lived um, in subarctic regions and adapted to living in the Arctic. Whereas there is no way for bears found um, uh, or, or any other terrestrial animals found in the southern continents to get to Antarctica because there's a, a huge ocean barrier in the way. So there's no way that you could have bears in uh, Antarctica. Um, uh, penguins in the Antarctic um, would not be able to get to the Arctic without crossing over um, thousands and thousands of kilometers of unsuitable habitat for penguins. So even though there might be suitable habitats for penguins in the Arctic, uh, there's no way that they can get there. Um, likewise, you know, polar bears might be able to survive in the Antarctic, but 
they can't get there without crossing habitats that they wouldn't be able to live in. Uh, same idea with you know the uh, Indo-Pacific fishes and the Caribbean fishes. Although there are some interesting uh, species pairings on the east and west side of the Isthmus of Panama where there are species that are different but are obviously related and share a lot of genes and, and physical characteristics uh, like the queen angelfish of the Atlantic Ocean and the king angelfish of the Pacific Ocean which are found just on opposite sides of this narrow piece of land uh, and shared a common ancestor at a time that North and South America were not connected and um, angelfish populations mixed between the two oceans uh, at that time over three million years ago. Um, so uh, if I asked you to give an example of a biogeographical pattern on Earth today, you might explain uh, either of these two patterns or, or find a biogeographical pattern of your own and explain it based on the uh, historical and evolutionary factors, including barriers to dispersal, as well as the modern day conditions of the habitat. An interesting uh, type of biological classification that's been done with the oceans is dividing the world's oceans up into 54 different biogeographical provinces based on these are chunks of the ocean that have sort of like a similar set of conditions and uh, are interconnected with each other and have similar sets of species. So um, the scientist who came up with these patterns was named Longhurst. Um, that's why they're called the Longhurst Biogeographical Provinces. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about these is that in areas where uh, there are no barriers at a certain latitude, um, then you have the same biogeographical province that, ex uh, that circles the globe at that latitude. So with these three different um, provinces in the Southern Ocean, uh, they circle the entire Southern Ocean. Whereas when you get to uh, uh, these latitudes where continents are barriers to species dispersal, then you have totally different um, biogeographic provinces on either side of the barrier to dispersal. Um, so there would be like few or no species in common between the Atlantic and Pacific provinces, even though they're at about the same latitude um, due to the uh, barriers to dispersal. So um, that is all that we have for this uh, first lecture and um, thank you for attention and I'll uh, look forward to giving the next one. Bye-bye.